The Lord be with you. <clears throat> Good morning, welcome. It is the first Sunday of Advent. Therefore, uh, the blue pyramids and the Advent uh, uh, candles and, and the like. Um, it is also, also the last weekend to sign up for Advent by candlelight. Uh, Baby City will be provided this year. There are a number of spaces available yet. Sign up with a friend or just sign up by yourself and be ready to meet some new people. It's a nice evening um, and uh, more information on that is in the bulletin. Sign up is in the narthex. You might have noticed the Christmas giving tree is up. Uh, there are a lot of gift certificates on that tree. A lot of people like to receive gift certificates. If you're going to go that route, think about using Scrip in the church office as a way uh, to support our school. Um, finally, Watertown High School Kailers will be here at the beginning of the 1030 service. If you wish to stick around after Bible study, you're welcome to do so. Opening hymn, Savior of the Nations, come, divine service setting two on page 167. <laughs>
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. It's called an ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. <coughs> for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come that by your protection we may be rescued from the threatening perils of our sins and saved by your mighty deliverance. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> The Old Testament reading for the first Sunday in Advent is from Ezekiel chapter 3. And at the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if, but if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die for his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. Again, if a righteous person turns from his righteousness and commits injustice, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because you have not warned him, he shall die for his sin. 
and his righteous deeds that he has done shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the righteous person not to sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he took warning, and you will have delivered your soul. This is the word of the Lord. We read responsively by whole verse, Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Oh, where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed and shield, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, the night is bright as the day, for the darkness is as light with you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle is from Romans chapter 10. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will, we, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news! But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth, and the words to the ends of the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. But in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. 
But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when that time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Sermon text is from the Gospel lesson. Jesus said, And what I say to you, I say to all, stay away. <coughs> On Friday is my day off. I usually drive Gail to her workplace in Madison and then spend the day there running errands, reading, maybe writing a newsletter article. After lunch, I walk often to the Wisconsin Historical Society. There's a large reading room there on the second floor that was recently restored. It's just exquisite. Mahogany tables, green glass reading lamps, ornate columns supporting uh, stained glass skylight panels some 50 feet up. It's a gem. They also have these wonderful leather reading chairs with ottomans. They are plush and comfortable. I really don't go there planning to nap. <laughs> Gail has been accusing me of having sleep apnea, an allegation I vigorously deny. But I'm beginning to wonder now because the last time I was in that reading room, I think I might have snorted myself awake. When I opened my eyes, people were looking at me. One guy was chuckling. I decided it was ta time to pack my things and move along. Jesus once told his disciples, what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Just how are we to do that? How are we to remain alert and watchful? He's talking of his return, of course. Be on guard, keep awake. It's like a man going on a journey, he says. When he leaves home, he puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned work, and he commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come. Don't let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Four times... In just four verses, he says, stay awake. He's usually not that redundant. He doesn't repeat himself like that. So it must be important. There must be a lot on the line. The Wall Street Journal reported that an alarming number of pilots and air traffic controllers have been falling asleep on the job. Of course, it's incredibly dangerous because lives depend on them staying awake. Similarly, it's incredibly dangerous for us to fall asleep spiritually, which means to be ignorant of or oblivious to or unaccepting of the great grace that Jesus wants to give us. Indeed, to fall asleep on that job puts our eternal lives at risk. Reading this text, Jesus gives the impression that his return would be imminent. This generation will not pass away, he says, before these things take place. For some, that's an embarrassment. They think Jesus got it wrong. After all, we're 2,000 years later here. But let's think about that for a moment. Earlier in this same chapter, Jesus is at the temple in Jerusalem. He's just watched the widow plunk in her two little mites and has commented on her generosity. Then as they walked out of the temple complex, one of the disciples is struck again by the beauty of the temple. Look, teacher, he says, what massive stones, what a magnificent building. And that temple truly was one of the most impressive man-made structures of the ancient world. We know some of those stones were 37 feet long, 12 feet high, 18 feet wide. How did, they, how did they dig those out? How did they move them from the quarry to the mount? How did they pay for that all? The disciples are impressed, maybe proud too of their people's achievement, and they want Jesus to be as well. But Jesus disappoints them. Do you see this great building? He asks. Not one stone will be left on top of the other. Every one of them will be toppled. 
Jesus is prophesying the destruction of the temple, which would happen within that generation's lifetime. In 70 AD, the Romans leveled the city, paying the most careful attention to the destruction of the temple. Stones were even pried apart and toppled. Excavations in 1968 uncovered a large number of these huge stones left behind where they had fallen centuries before. So when Jesus says, this generation will not pass away before these things take place, he's not speaking of his glorious return. He's speaking of the destruction of the temple. And he uses that unthinkable event as an image or a symbol for the destruction, the horrific destruction that will take place on the last day. Is his return imminent? I believe it is. All the signs are in place and have been for some time. Besides which, our lifespans are, are short. Job says our days pass by swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Whether he first comes with a trumpet blast and angels five, ten years from now, or quietly into your hospital room to take you home five, ten years from now, either way, we need to be ready for that day. We need to be spiritually awake and alert. Yet we have this tendency to live as if that day will never come. It's a long ways off, we think. And he's a long ways off. In China, the game of golf is officially frowned upon as a rich man's game. In fact, in the mid-1990s, the central government declared it illegal to develop any new golf courses in China. But in China, such decrees aren't always taken at face value. The Chinese have a saying, the mountain is high, and the emperor on the other side of the mountain is a long ways off. So in the five years following that decree, the number of golf courses in China actually tripled. In fact, it became the global hotspot for golf course development. They just don't use the G word. One area alone, 22 golf courses were developed. They call it the Yangsheng District Land Consolidation and Ecological Project. <laughs> Local government officials lend their support because the kickbacks from the developers <laughs> enriches them. Sometimes we live like that too. We live within the loopholes. We live as if we have all the time in the world. We live as if the mountain is high and the emperor a long ways away. But here comes Jesus with a surprisingly redundant message. Stay awake. Four times in four verses. Stay awake. One way or another, his return is imminent. We don't know when that day will be, so we should live in such a way that it doesn't matter. This is not a comfortable text for me because I'm hardly ready for this day, much less that day. On Monday, during the first significant snowstorm around here, I made a bunch of shutting calls. And during the, uh, during the small talk, several times I heard the refrain, Pastor, I'm just not ready for winter again. Not after last winter. Ready or not, there's no stopping winter from coming, is there? It's the same way with the advent of our Lord. There's no stopping him. The key is to be ready for him. And left to ourselves, we would never be able to stay awake. We would never be ready. But we are not left to ourselves. Our gracious Lord is quietly working behind the scenes, has been for millennia now. Preparing you and me for the day of his return. These preparations were first promised in the garden when he pledged to crush the serpent's head. God already had a plan in mind to make things right. These preparations continued with the flood, the covenant, the Passover, the exodus, 
the release from Babylonian captivity. All those Old Testament events are part of the preparations God made for you. So you would understand how seriously he takes your sin. But also how seriously he is about forgiving you. And having mercy on you. And saving you from sin and death. God continued the preparations by putting just the right couple in place in Bethlehem so that, as promised, Jesus would be born in the city of David and of the house and lineage of David. As a man, Jesus crisscrosses the land, preaching, teaching, healing, and in all this, preparing us so that we could know him, put our trust in him, look to him for help and strength and salvation. To prepare for Holy Week, he puts Caiaphas in the Praetorium and Pilate on the governor's seat and Herod as Tetrarch of Galilee and over them all Tiberius Caesar as the Roman Emperor. Just the right guys in the right places to react in the right and predictable ways according to the Lord. The political tensions are high. The crowds are primed to play their part. Then when all was ready, when the dominoes were all lined up, the Lord gave the first one a little poke. And in just a few days, the crowds are rioting, demanding his crucifixion. At this point, with Caesar Tiberius breathing down their necks to keep the peace, Pilate and Herod and Caiaphas, they feel their hands are tied. And so they tie his hands. That's the expedient thing to do. That's the practical thing to do to keep the peace. Caiaphas nailed it when he said it's better that one man die for the people than the whole nation should perish. All this happened at just the right time while the people are celebrating their Passover feast. The occasion when they're ancestors were freed from slavery by the blood of the Lamb. While they are celebrating their Passover, a Roman soldier drives spikes into the limbs of the one whom John the Baptist years before called the Lamb of God. Takes away the sin of the world. And that blood of that Lamb set us free from slavery to sin and death point is, Holy Week was the most orchestrated event in history. God was throwing the switch on a plan that was in place from before the foundation of the world. All this to make sure you are ready on the last day. That's not the end. Fast forward to Pentecost where the Holy Spirit gives the gift of language and holy zeal to the apostles who scatter and start preaching Christ crucified. The gospel takes root, spreads to the nations including what is now northern Europe where many of your ancestors came from. Fast forward to the dark ages where the clergy and the scholars have all but buried the gospel in muck and mire but somehow God continues to sustain the faith through the laity, and light continues to shine in the darkness. Fast forward again to the 1840s and 1850s when he prompted many of your relatives to pay a handsome fee to get on a creaking, leaking boat and make the perilous journey over the Atlantic. I hope you know how many of them were doing that for you, not for themselves. They were starting over and they knew it takes usually two or three generations to recover from such a thing. And I hope you know many of them made that trip so that you could worship him in freedom and in truth rather than being consigned to some watered down, tedious state religion. Fast forward again to that day when God used your parents to bring you to the font. You were probably a baby, maybe sleeping contentedly as was little Owen who was baptized last night. There may not have been ice in the baptismal water, but it sure felt like that. And when Owen, when that water splashed on his head, arms went up and he started hollering. He was splashed awake, at least spiritually, in the waters of baptism. Fast forward to this day, who knows? 
Maybe even, he's even using this passage, this fourfold redundancy to shake you awake and this supper to prepare you for his return. If left to ourselves, we wouldn't stand a chance. We'd fall asleep in a heartbeat. It's not that we intend to sleep, but things happen. Listen again to the assurance he gives us in the epistle lesson. The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's a passage that surprises us for what it doesn't say. There's no word about always being obedient and diligent. No word about being worthy. Apparently, salvation doesn't depend on, on you. It depends on the strength and grace and love of Jesus Christ. Trust in him, then, with all your heart and confess him with your lips. Don't look inward for some strength that's going to get you through those terrible days. You won't find anything worth clinging to there. Trust in him. He has made all the necessary preparations. And with his word and sacraments, he will keep you strong, awake, alert, to the end. Amen. And the, uh, the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand to confess our Lord with our lips using the Nicene Creed on page 174. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God, very God, begotten, not made, one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In our prayers, we pray for those who are ill, for Del Boyer recovering from surgery, for Rosie Torkelson, uh, for Bill Roser who is in hospice care, for Doris Timmer undergoing tests on Friday. We pray also for uh, Sue Arnold and, and her family, uh, Sue had two members of her family die this last week of unrelated illnesses, Vern Wilkes and Betty Wilkes. Let us pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the faithful proclamation of Christ's saving name, that God's people may be strengthened in the true faith and his kingdom extended, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For missionaries and others who proclaim the gospel to those who do not know Christ, that God would strengthen them and grant them joy in their calling, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For steadfast faith, that we may be found ready at the return of Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For true devotion as we prepare to celebrate our Lord's birth, that our hearts may be set on things above and not on earthly things. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. 
for this congregation and all our members that God would enable us to work together as fellow members of the body of Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for our nation and all its citizens, for the president and members of Congress, for our governor and representatives, for all judges and magistrates, that we may lead peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For the men and women in our armed forces, that God would keep them in safety, especially during dangerous deployments, and bless their efforts to establish peace and tranquility. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For those who are sick, for Dell, Rosie, Bill, for those undergoing tests, for Doris, for those whom we name in our hearts, that God would grant healing to their bodies and strength to bear their infirmities with patience and grace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For those who mourn, especially for Sue Arnold and her family, that in their time of sorrow they would not lose hope, but rely on God's promise that he will not leave them or forsake them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who live alone and have limited opportunities to leave their homes, that their loneliness may be eased by God's abiding presence and by their fellowship in the communion of saints. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
We continue with the preface on page 177. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared, proclaiming him the promised Messiah, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and calling sinners to repentance that they might escape from the wrath to be revealed when he comes again in glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all alien sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name of the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you've given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage. 
That on the day of his coming we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.